The atomic age began at exactly 5.30 Mountain War time on the morning of July 16, 1945, on a stretch of semi-desert land about 50 airline miles from Alamogordo, New Mexico. And just at the instance there rose from the bowels of the earth a light not of this world, the light of many suns in one. Journalist William L. Lawrence, New York Times, September 26, 1945. This is Direct Current, an Energy.gov podcast. I'm Matt Dozier. Welcome to the first of two episodes that will tell the story of an unprecedented U.S. government effort to beat Nazi Germany in the race to construct a nuclear weapon. Producers Allison Lantero and Simon Edelman will take you back to the start of it all. Find out how the atomic age began, what happened in three top secret towns, and how the Department of Energy and the National Park Service teamed up to preserve the legacy of this pivotal moment in history. All right, have a podcast about energy. The jewels that these national labs are. In terms of science, scientific capabilities. Big dreams can happen. Keeping our nation safe. Clean energy is the way of the future. It's America's economic engine. It's science for the people. This is Direct Current. December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivered this speech the day after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, which dragged the United States into World War II. You might think that this was the moment America decided to build a nuclear bomb. You'd be wrong. The Manhattan Project was the codename for the nation's top secret quest for atomic weapons. And the story begins nearly two years earlier. October 11th, 1939. On that day, President Roosevelt received a letter from a theoretical physicist. He wrote, In the course of the last four months, it has been made probable through the work of Joliot in France, as well as Fermi and Szilard in America, that it may become possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium by which vast amounts of power and large quantities of new radium-like elements would be generated. Now it appears almost certain that this could be achieved in the immediate future. This new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of bombs, and it is conceivable, so much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be constructed. Yes, very truly, Albert Einstein. Yes, that same German-born theoretical physicist we all know, Albert Einstein. Just a week later, Roosevelt wrote Einstein back, informing the physicist that he had set up a committee consisting of civilian and military representatives to study uranium. They called it the Uranium Committee, and this will eventually become the U.S. Department of Energy. This one decision sets a series of chain reactions that would eventually create a top-secret system that spans six states and, at its peak, employed over 100,000 people. The Manhattan Project. But the Manhattan Project didn't start out quite so massive. In the first months after Einstein and Roosevelt exchanged letters, some of the smallest science possible was being conducted in a system that would grow over time into what are today the 17 national laboratories. And these scientists were running up against a big problem. A big problem on a very small scale. Early 1940. Researchers knew that uranium, an element found in tiny amounts all over the Earth, could be used to create a chain reaction explosion. Here's how that works. When you bombard a uranium atom with energy, sometimes neutrons fly out of its nucleus, releasing lots more energy in the process. 
They call it splitting the atom, or nuclear fission. If there is enough uranium, a neutron from the first atom can hit the nucleus of another atom and cause it to split, and so on and so on, giving you a nuclear chain reaction. But there's a catch. 99.3% of naturally occurring uranium exists in a form known as uranium-238. Uranium-238 isn't very good for sustaining the kind of chain reaction necessary for a nuclear weapon. For that, you need a far less prevalent form, or isotope, called uranium-235. So scientists had to figure out how to separate uranium-235 from uranium-238. These two isotopes are chemically identical, which means the two cannot be separated by a chemical process. And with their masses differing by less than 1%, separation by a physical process would be extremely difficult and expensive. Still, scientists press forward on a couple of complicated techniques to physically separate the two isotopes, all based on that tiny difference in atomic weight. Flash forward to May 1941. A scientist named Glenn T. Seaborg proved that the newly discovered element plutonium was almost twice as likely as uranium to create a chain reaction. Most importantly, it could be chemically separated from the widely available uranium-238. These two elements, uranium-235 and plutonium, would become the basis for the two bombs that were dropped to end World War II and begin the atomic age. But before any of that could happen, the government had to figure out how to best organize the project under a shroud of total secrecy. Who will lead it, and what to call it? Now the Army Corps of Engineers have a practice of naming their districts as engineer districts, and they use the main city in the district as the name. So this one happened to be located in New York City, Manhattan, so they called it the Manhattan District. And when they changed it to a project, they just used that same name and called it the Manhattan Project. That was Y-12 historian Ray Smith in Oak Ridge. We'll hear more from him later. The Manhattan Project was a vast, complicated undertaking. So we're going to break it down. An easy way to understand how the Manhattan Project worked is to split it into three phases. Phase one. Research and development. Phase two. Plutonium production and uranium enrichment. Phase 3. Design and production of the first wartime atomic weapons. The Manhattan Project operated like a large construction company, but on a massive scale and with an incredible sense of urgency. In order to function properly, they had to purchase sites, manage contracts, hire personnel, build housing and service facilities, order materials, and set up systems for keeping track of all the money and people flowing into the project. And although we're mainly focusing on the three major sites that become the Manhattan Project National Historic Park, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Hanford, Washington, and Los Alamos, New Mexico, there were other places that contributed research and materials for the project. Phase one. Phase one begins even before Hanford, Oak Ridge, or Los Alamos. It goes back to one of the most important branches of the Manhattan Project, the Metallurgical Laboratory, or MetLab, in Chicago, Illinois. Here, scientists from east and west coast were brought together to develop chain reacting piles for plutonium production, devise methods for extracting plutonium from the irradiated uranium, and design a weapon. Most of the research, preparation, refining, and gathering took place here. In an abandoned squash court under the West Grandstand of the University of Chicago's Stag Field lay a huge oblong pile of black bricks and wooden timbers, shrouded on all sides but one by gray balloon material. Security regulations forbid the engineers from explaining what the Army wanted with a giant square balloon. These workers made bricks for the pile until their faces were so covered with graphite dust that they looked like coal miners. Unlike most reactors that have been built since, this first one had no radiation shielding and no cooling system of any kind. Enrico Fermi, who led this experiment, had convinced everyone that his calculations were reliable enough to rule out a runaway chain reaction or explosion. But 
as the official historians of the Atomic Energy Commission later noted, they were still conducting a possibly catastrophic experiment in one of the most densely populated areas of the nation. December 2nd, 1942. Less than one year after Pearl Harbor, under the grandstand at Stagg Field, the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction was achieved. Now the pace really quickens. Phase two. This is where Oak Ridge and Hanford come in. They were working almost simultaneously. The Oak Ridge Reservation included separate industrial processes for uranium enrichment and experimental plutonium production. The first person put in charge of the Manhattan Project was Colonel James Marshall. But he moved too cautiously for a project of this size. So the Army turned to Lieutenant General Leslie Groves. Groves, an engineer by trade, had just finished building the Pentagon. He knew how to put a large construction project together, get private industry involved, and spend money efficiently and effectively. His first acts were to move the headquarters of the Manhattan Project from New York City to Washington, D.C., and to procure land in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Some might argue that Oak Ridge was destined to become part of the Manhattan Project. Back around the turn of the 20th century, the Bear Creek Valley was lush with forest and scattered with families on small settlements. One of them was the Hendricks family. In 1900, John Hendricks' wife and children left him shortly after his youngest daughter's death. According to legend, Now that really upset John. So he prayed to God, wanting to know why this is happening to him. Heard a loud voice during one of those prayers that said, if you'll go sleep on the ground for 40 nights, you'll learn the future of this place. Now, it must have been in the wintertime, because as the story goes, his hair froze to the ground. As you can imagine, after hearing the voice of God and sleeping on frigid ground in the dead of winter, you're going to have some stories to tell. And he told anybody that would listen. He'd tell them there's going to be a huge factory built in Bear Creek Valley that'll help win the greatest war there'll ever be. Going to be a city built on Black Oak Ridge. Going to be a railroad spur run right down by his property line. And the seat of power for all this is going to be between Pike's Place and Tadlock's Farm. It might sound like a tall tale, but John Hendricks shared his visions with people for years before his death in 1915. And when the Manhattan Project arrived nearly 30 years later, they started coming true. The first shovel full of dirt they dug was right between Pike's Place and Tadlock's Farm. That's where they built the administration building. That's where the federal office building is today. That city on Black Oak Ridge is called Oak Ridge. That railroad spur runs right down by his property line in Hendricks Creek subdivision, named for John Hendricks, and he's buried there, by the way. And of course, Y-12 is in Bear Creek Valley, where the uranium was obtained for Little Boy that did help win World War II. These three sites are located in valleys away from the town of Oak Ridge. This provided security and containment in case of explosions. The Y-12 area was home to the electromagnetic uranium plant, or Calutron, and it was located closest to Oak Ridge. Now, the way a Calutron works, there's no moving parts, and it's very simple to think about it. The word Calutron is a mashup of California and cyclotron since the cyclotron was developed at UC Berkeley. During the Manhattan Project, they used cyclotrons to obtain substantial quantities of high-purity uranium-235 by taking advantage of that small mass difference we talked about earlier. To do that, first they mixed the uranium with chloride and heated it up so it became ionized. Then they put huge electromagnets on either side to separate out the isotope they wanted. Ray Smith explains the rest of the process. If I had two rubber bands hanging down from my hand, I put a golf ball on one and a ping pong ball on the other, held it to my side, and then spun it real quick for a half a turn, that golf ball would stretch that rubber band further than the ping pong ball. So I'd get two arcs. The same thing happens with uranium-235 and 238. The other major site at Oak Ridge is the X-10 graphite reactor, the first plutonium refining facility. Normally in the chemical industry, you build a semi-works or pilot plant to get the bugs out, finalize the design, and then go build a full-scale facility. However, 
For the Manhattan Project, they didn't have that kind of time. So, although X-10 was the pilot plant for the Hanford Sites B reactor, construction started on it just six months ahead of the Washington facility. That small window of time, it turned out to be very valuable because it allowed them to make changes at Hanford should a mysterious leak develop in the B reactor. More on that in a bit. But first, we should note that the X-10 reactor was built in just 10 months and went critical on... November 4th, 1943. Tom Mason, Oak Ridge National Laboratory Director, explains what that means. That means that a self-sustaining chain reaction had started, and uh, that's what's necessary to run a reactor. And of course, it's also what's necessary uh, for, for the bomb to work. They were kind of exploring the physics of fission, but also the production of the material. The X-10 graphite reactor supplied Los Alamos with the first significant amounts of plutonium for research and experimentation. Fission studies on these samples from Oak Ridge heavily influenced plutonium bomb design. Oak Ridge was not only working to separate uranium, but they were also conducting research and training scientists and technicians who would eventually go to Hanford to work at the plutonium separation facility. So that's site number one, Oak Ridge. However, those in charge didn't want to put all their nuclear eggs in one basket. General Groves wasn't keen on the idea of locating full-scale plutonium production reactors at Oak Ridge, right near the uranium-235 separation plants. Plus, there was not enough electricity to power another big facility. And the site was uncomfortably close to Knoxville, should an accident occur. Earlier that year, after a search in the western United States, Groves authorized the establishment of the Hanford Engineer Works, at a site on the Columbia River in southeastern Washington state. January 1943. The isolated 670 square mile Hanford site offered abundant hydroelectric power, while the flat but rocky terrain provided excellent support for the huge plutonium production buildings. But this land came at a steep price. The Hanford landscape represented one of the first acts of the Manhattan Project to condemn private property and evict homeowners and Native American tribes to clear the way for the top secret work. Former Hanford worker and vice president of the Tri-Cities Industrial Council, Gary Peterson, tells this story of what's known as the Tri-Cities of White Bluffs, Hanford, and Richland, Washington. White Bluffs was the bigger city of the two. It was out there, a population about 240, 250. But it was a huge agricultural area. The Hanford site actually had the earliest Uh, fruit growing anywhere in the Pacific Northwest. And so they grew apples, they grew walnuts, they grew peaches, they grew all kinds of uh, fruits from fruit trees. The story was that a young woman who picked and packed peaches at one of the farms would always write her name inside the crates. One day, the woman ended up putting her name and address in the box to see where the box of fruit went. The box of fruit ended up in in a New York a restaurant, and the, the chef there found it, and he sent a note back to her and said, this is where your peaches ended up. Try to imagine what White Bluffs and Hanford might have looked like today had the Manhattan Project not existed. My feeling is that that would be one of the richest agricultural areas in the whole state of Washington. Bar none. Bar none. I mean, it, you put water on that desert, and it just grows stuff. Then there was the third city, Richland. Almost all of the people who lived in Richland were were looked on as being different from the people who lived in Pasco or Kennewick. I mean, it was a kind of an insular community. And so the people in Richland stuck together, they played cards together, they, you know, supported their football teams together, those kind of thing. These were people who were tied to their land and didn't appreciate General Groves and the U.S. Army trying to kick them off it. Many local landowners rejected the first offers and took the Army to court. Colonel Mathias, whose orders were to purchase half a million acres in the area, decided to settle out of court as time was a much scarcer resource than money. Summer 1943. Richland, White Bluffs, and Hanford were depopulated to make room for the nuclear production facility, an atomic boomtown known as the Hanford Site. As time was of the essence, Allied intelligence knew that the Germans were working on nuclear weapons, but not how far they had gotten. No one wanted to take any chances. 
Therefore, Hanford and Oak Ridge were built simultaneously, and the projects were tested far less had it been during peacetime. At Hanford, the mission was focused purely on separating plutonium, and that was done at a facility called the B-Reactor. September 1944. The B-Reactor was the world's first large-scale plutonium production reactor. Its design mimicked that of the X-10 graphite reactor at Oak Ridge, but on a much larger scale, and using water instead of air as a coolant. To give you an idea of the size difference, X-10 needed 1,000 kilowatts to function, while the B-Reactor was designed to operate at 250,000 kilowatts. The B-Reactor is basically a 28 by 36 foot, 1,200 ton graphite cylinder lying on its side with 2,004 aluminum tubes all up and down its length. 200 tons of uranium rods, the size of hot dogs, are sealed inside aluminum cans and placed in the tubes. Then, cooling water from the Columbia River, which is first treated, was pumped through the aluminum tubes and around the uranium rods. Tour guide Ann Vargas described the process at the B-reactor. The making of plutonium change in uranium into that product of plutonium generates enormous amounts of heat. And so here at the reactor, water was chosen to cool that process. So in the beginning, they had something like 30,000 gallons of water every minute going through this reactor. In later years, after modifications were made, there was as much as 70,000 gallons of water a minute going through this reactor. To help you put that in perspective, in the later years when they increased the water flow through here because plutonium production was increased, this reactor could have provided enough water for a city with a population of somewhere around 300,000. The uranium rods would drop into water pools behind the piles and then are moved by remote-controlled rail cars to a storage facility five miles away for transportation to their final destination at one of the two chemical separation locations, which were also massive, scaled-up versions of those at Oak Ridge. Right before midnight, September 26th, 1944. After a full year of building, it was time to fire up the machine. It worked just like it was supposed to, until... Within 13 hours or so, it started shutting down. Well, it turns out that iodine-129 is a product that's produced in there, and that produces xenon. And xenon is a neutron absorber, like boron. It absorbs the neutron, so we're shutting it down. That's Rick Bond, another tour guide at Hanford. And he explained that another man, by the name of John Wheeler, had seen a similar thing happen at the X-10 graphite reactor in Oak Ridge. Wheeler was the one who had figured out that it was the xenon poisoning. And luckily, there was an easy fix. They built 2004 process tubes in here, but originally when Fermi calculated this out, they figured they needed about 1,500 process okay, tubes so to load up that much fuel. But then they said, let's we better build 500 more just in case. So they have continued 500 more, and it turned out they needed that 500 wow. more. But it was actually the DuPont company that insisted on including additional fuel when the facility was built. Thanks to their foresight, the Hanford team was able to load up 500 extra tubes and get enough neutrons flying around for the reactor to work. At this point, the Manhattan Project was really starting to take shape. There was a site for plutonium production in Washington and a site for uranium production in Tennessee, but they still needed a place to build the device. So the site for the weapons design laboratory of the Manhattan Project had to meet certain criteria. It had to be far inland. The land had to be easy to acquire. It had to be not too far away from a rail hub. Los Alamos really fit all those requirements, but there were other places as well. And so the Manhattan Project had narrowed down the potential sites to several regions in the western United States. Now, one of those regions was northern New Mexico. Enter J. Robert Oppenheimer, the man we know as the father of the atomic bomb. He had just been appointed to lead the secret weapons facility. Alan Carr, the historian you just heard, explains. Oppenheimer had uh, grown up in New York City, but he had plenty of money, and he and his brother Frank used to like to come out here and rent a cabin not far from Los Alamos. So he was very familiar with the area. He, General Groves, a few other Manhattan Project officials came out uh, to New Mexico on a scouting trip. They drove over the mountain to Los Alamos, which Oppenheimer had suggested, and uh, they decided almost immediately this was the spot. It met all of those basic requirements, and it was defensible, and uh, work very quickly started moving forward on, uh, well, letting the people who were already here know that they would have to be 
leaving and making plans to build the laboratory and the town version. We're still a ways off from getting to Los Alamos, and so was the Manhattan Project. In order to end up at Los Alamos, they needed a way of producing and moving everything they needed for the bomb with the utmost secrecy. As a famous wartime poster said, Loose lips might sink ships. With a ship this size, there was bound to be talk. So only a few people actually knew everything that was going on at either site, much less the entire operation. At Oak Ridge, a company called Tennessee Eastman was hired by the Army Corps of Engineers to manage Y-12. Out of the 22,000 workers, only about 100, if that, knew what was going on. The chemist would have known they were working on uranium. Most of the others wouldn't have had a clue what they were working on. Some of the workforce were young women called cubicle operators. Today, they're often referred to as Calutron girls. Tennessee Eastman was hiring these young girls right out of high school and training them to keep that meter on a certain spot, let it drift to a control point, and then bring it back. The Calutron girls might not have known what they were working on, but they knew it was important. Because at the end of the training class, this man came in who was obviously somebody important because he was dressed in suit clothes. And he said, Young ladies, we can't tell you what you're doing. We can only tell you how to do it. All I can say is that if our enemy gets it first, God help us. Meanwhile, at Hanford, even the schoolhouses were abuzz about what was going on. One of the teachers one day asked all of her students, you know, what, what do you think your dad and mom who work out there are doing? This one boy raises his hand all excited. I know, I know, I know. And she says, wow, what? And he says, well, they're building toilet paper. And she says, what? How? And he says, well, every day my dad goes to work with his lunch packet, and every day he comes home with a roll of toilet paper, so obviously. While there was plenty of speculation, the truth stayed hidden. It was the mentality of all of the people who were here from 1943 on. You know, don't tell your neighbor anything that you wouldn't want to have spread. You could tell if you were out on site by the badge, which area you worked in. So you never took your badge. And I mean, it was once you got off the site, your badge was tucked away someplace. And so it was secret. As for project leadership, the secrecy allowed them to make decisions with little regard for normal peacetime political considerations. Groves knew that as long as he had the backing of the White House, Money would be available, and he could focus entirely on running the bomb project. It also meant that those involved with the Manhattan Project had to get creative in order to keep the project moving and obtain all the equipment they needed. The war effort forced many to play roles they never expected. Los Alamos historian Ellen McGee tells us the story of Robert Wilson, a physicist at Princeton University who got recruited to work covertly on atomic research for the Manhattan Project. When Wilson was tasked with going to Harvard University and borrowing an important piece of equipment, he and a small team of colleagues invented a backstory and did their best secret agent impressions. They wanted Harvard Cyclotron. So they go to Harvard. They are meeting with the acting president, Paul Buck, and also with a professor of physics. His name is Percy Bridgman. It's like the beginning of a joke. A doctor, a lawyer, and a physicist put on disguises and walk into Harvard. That they represented an Army medical station located at St. Louis, Missouri, which needed a cyclotron for some kind of medical research. And so they had oh, uh, some medical insignia on this doctor's uniform, and they are trying to figure out a way to get this piece of equipment without just coming in and sort of taking government eminent domain. They go through all of this sort of negotiation, and then Bridgman says, and I'll quote, Well, if you want it for what you say you want it, you can't have it. But if you want it for why I think you want it, then you can have it. Even though a lot of universities weren't supposed to know what was going on with the Manhattan Project, they knew that something big was happening. So they released the equipment. So the B-reactor plutonium separation facility was up and running at Hanford. The electromagnetic uranium facility Y-12 was chugging along at Oak Ridge. 
But there was one more step remaining. Phase three. The final link in the Manhattan Project's far-flung network is the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. This is phase three. Here's Alan Carr. The Los Alamos function basically was we were the weapons design laboratory. Our goal was to design, build, and help figure out ways to deliver the nuclear weapons in combat. And so that was basically our function. This is kind of where all of the work came together. This is where all of the materials and all of that effort manifested itself in the form of combat weapons. In order for all the work to come together, they'd have to get the uranium from Oak Ridge and the plutonium from Hanford out to New Mexico. Ray Smith tells us how it was done. Now they take it out of those collectors, put it in small, gold-lined, coffee cup-sized containers, put two of them in a briefcase, strap it to an Army lieutenant's arm, dress him up to look like a salesman, put him on a passenger train up through Chicago and out to Los Alamos. That's how every bit of the uranium for Little Boy got transported from Y-12 to Los Alamos. Coming up in part two, building the bomb, ending the war, and a modern day effort to keep the stories of the men and women who made it possible alive. Speaking of which, we'll actually have a short circuit mini episode about Ruth Huddleston, one of the so-called Calutron girls at Oak Ridge and the secret life she lived during the Manhattan Project. Stay tuned for that next week. Make sure you subscribe to Direct Current so you don't miss the conclusion of our two-part series on the Manhattan Project. Keep listening after the credits for a taste of what's to come. You can learn all about the Manhattan Project National Historic Park on our website, energy.gov slash podcast, where you'll also find plenty of other great stories on science and energy. If you have questions about this episode or any other episode, you can email us at directcurrent at hq.doe.gov or tweet at energy. If you're enjoying Direct Current, help us spread the word. Tell your friends about the show and leave us a rating or review on iTunes. We appreciate your feedback. We'd like to give an atomic thank you to the folks at Oak Ridge, Jonathan Sitzler, Ray Smith, Tom Mason, Claire Sinclair, and to everyone else who lent us bikes, took us on windshield tours, and put up with our incessant questions. At Hanford, thank you to Colleen French, Gary Peterson, Ann Vargas, Rick Bond, Whit Vogel, and Marcus Goch. Representing Los Alamos, thank you to the dynamic duo of Alan Carr and Ellen McGee. And thank you to Marcus and Ernie Ambrose for their vocal talent and Taylor Gray from Transition Music. Finally, thanks to Vernon Heron, Kayla Hensley, Bob House, and the Energy Public Affairs team, both past and present. Direct Current is produced by Matt Dozier, Simon Edelman, and me, Allison Lantero. Art and design by Court Career, with support from Paul Lester, Daniel Wood, and Atikwar H. We are a production of the U.S. Department of Energy and published from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. And it was important to our country. You think that people can't keep secrets, but I found out that women can keep secrets. We really did. We did a good job. I don't think that there was really a decision to use the atomic bombs because, again, it's a no-brainer. You've got a new weapon, of course you're going to try it before you try a blockade or you try an invasion. I mean, it's just terrible what happened, but it did end the war. And there were a lot of people then who were saved additional to those that got killed. I think it would have been maybe much worse. The, the fact that this is a national park that's in three locations and it won't be owned by the National Park Service, it's going to be owned by DOE, is unique. Kids in school need to learn about this. This is a good place to keep everything so that you can still see it. Welcome to the Bee Reactor, one of our newest national historical parks. So we're very proud to now be a part of the National Park Service. Well, if you look at Oak Ridge National Lab today and the areas of research that we're in, you can actually see the fingerprints of what we did during the war. You'll go to the park and you'll, you'll get a basic core theme and you'll see the basic core interpretation of what happened. And she stopped and she stared at me and her jaw dropped. She moved here in 1947 with her dad. Her dad worked over at Y-12 and she said, when did this become a national park? And she was, she was ecstatic.